Hello, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I'm excited to have as guests Viral Shah and Jeff Bizanson, who are two of the four original founders of the Julia programming language. Julia is a language that was designed for interactive scientific computing, but also supports JIT execution and other advanced features for software engineering purposes. And before we get into the interview, let's take a look at a quick demo. So here I've got an example program in Julia and another one in Python to demonstrate how it is that Julia can perform JIT compilation and execution of the code you write. So I've got the simple program here in Julia. Now normally you would use the built-in function for calculating the mean or average of a number of values, but here I've done it manually where I sum up the values in a loop and then I return the sum divided by the number of values in my vector. So over here I can import the contents of my module by saying using demo, and then I can create 100 million random numbers between zero and one, and now I can time the execution of calculating the mean of these values. Now, as usual, I should do this more than once to see how long it takes. Right now it's taking about 0.1 seconds, a little over 110 milliseconds. And I could alternatively use the built-in mean function and see how this compares. And we see here that the built-in mean function is taking at the moment uh, a little over 50 milliseconds to get the job done. And what the difference is between the built-in mean function and my mean function, I'm not entirely sure, but mine is running about twice as long uh, using relatively simple straightforward algorithm. And for comparison, I'm not gonna show it right now, but this Python version to manually go through the same loop takes about seven seconds as opposed to the 100 milliseconds or so we saw in Julia. So an important question is, why would I care about writing code manually instead of using built-in primitives? And the issue is just that when you're writing algorithms, sometimes it's easier and more straightforward just to write the code directly. So moving on to the interview, unlike my previous interviews, this one was actually done live through video conferencing. I just had to edit it down after the fact, which means there's a lot of cutting that went in there. And so people jump around a bit. I apologize, but hopefully we got what matters most. Let's see how it goes. So if you could introduce yourselves, that'd be awesome. Yeah, hi, I'm Viral Shah. I'm one of the co-founders of the Julia Language and Julia Computing, and I'm also uh, the CEO of Julia Computing. I'm Jeff Bizanson, also one of the creators of the Julia Language. How do you organize your roles? It sounds like all four of you that found it are still involved in Julia today. Yes. How does it work like in reality versus your roles and so on? Yeah, we've all sort of fallen into uh, roles over time. I mean, initially, we were all kind of doing the same things, you know, uh, talking to each other constantly and committing code and just getting something working. Uh, but over time, we've kind of uh, fallen into different roles, so just naturally somehow. And for all tends to kind of organize a lot of things uh, and work on funding and business and community uh, types of things, uh, like working on JuliaCon and just generally checking in on everyone and making sure everything is going okay. Uh, and, and he sometimes works on cer certain technical aspects. He's still, he'll still work on some sparse matrix or linear algebra stuff sometimes. So Jeff, you've been leading the charge on all the compiler uh, technologies and, and being the, still the number one committer, I think, in Julia. Yeah. Um, from day one, so that's pretty amazing. I think what has worked out well for all of us is that all of us continue to be completely technically involved. Like Stefan has been very deeply involved in the community aspects as well as um, driving key components like the package manager and you know all, all the things around artifacts and binaries and such things. So all of us tend to be completely technically involved, but also sort of, you know, working with customers and clients. It's kind of been a great ride so far to be able to do all these things and be together for 10 years. That's, you know, you don't hear that story often. Can you explain how Julia got started? Yeah, you know, the four of us sort of came together uh, through sort of individual conversations. Uh, so for example, uh, Jeff and I uh, used to be co-workers at this company called Interactive Supercomputing. And we always used to talk about how, you know, we need a much better language for scientific computing. Stefan and I used to go to grad school together and, you know, we used to uh, play on the ultimate Frisbee team. And we often used to again, talk about the deplorable state of numerical computing. At one point, all of us were sort of talking about this and it sort of led to an email thread. Uh, Jeff and Alan were talking about sort of you know, all the possibilities around what parallel computing could be. And so we just sort of all came together on an email thread. And then like, I think in three days, we had the first lines of code. Jeff committed the first working parser. And I think we had like actually meaningfully useful functionality, like even in the first two weeks, like you could actually do something. How do you look at things like Numba? I assume you're familiar with Numba and Python? Yeah, Jeff, do you want to go for that one? Yeah, they've, they've done a lot of good work, as I understand it, you know, for certain 
uh, pieces of Python code, you can put you know, their annotation on it and it will compile it to pretty fast native code. In the cases it handles, uh, their compiler seems to do a, a good job as far as I know, uh, and it can generate fast numeric kernels. Uh, but you know, it, it stems out of very specific uh, constraints that they had uh, that they, you know, they wanted to be compatible with NumPy and it had to work within the context of Python. There are just a lot of uh, constraints that you know, forced how it had to work. Uh, so they, they weren't really fully free to you know, start from a, a blank page and you know, do, do whatever they felt was best. And I think both projects have sort of been successful in their own way. Uh, people often like to sort of compare one against the other, but it's sort of just two different things altogether. Um, if you have complex user-defined data types, like Numba is just not going to work for you. You pretty much have to work with double precision arrays for the most part, um, or single precision arrays, but you can't have arrays of structs, for example. But Julia will let you do all those kinds of things. Yeah, so I mean, although Julia is, you know, the, the design of the language is maybe focused on kind of numerical stuff, and, you know, we've, we've said that, and a lot of people observe that, but uh, that doesn't really go very deep. The compiler is not really a like numerical compiler. It's a it's a general compiler, and you can define any data type and any function, and it will you know optimize all of that together. It's all about just you know inlining code, inlining laying out data efficiently, and it applies to every data type, not you know not just numbers. Do you see Julia as a language for things other than scientific computing? Do you see it for server applications and or client applications? Would you write a mobile application in Julia? In terms of the underlying technology. Like I just said, it's just a, you know, it's a general compiler. Uh, so if, if, if you look under the hood, you're not going to see anything that's very numerical. But uh, a lot of those other th kind of things depend on different sorts of features. It depends on a lot of stuff. It depends on uh, like what libraries are available in the ecosystem. Uh, it depends on, you know, like things like what people have written tutorials for. And then it depends on details like what size of executable uh, can the compiler produce and you know, whether you might need just-in-time compilation uh, for execution, which might not work in certain environments. So there's sort of the peripheral details like that might prevent people from using it in certain contexts. But uh, we, we hope to kind of break those down uh, over time. Even today, like people build web applications in Julia, like you can, you can build dashboards in Julia for your UIs. You can, you know, build complete GTK applications for like native client things. You can uh, build fairly high performance web servers just because Julia is high performance. So if you use Julia's MUX and HTTP stack, you get pretty high uh, performance out of the box. People have even built like a databases in Julia. There's nothing in the Julia language, like Jeff said, that, that makes it numerical only. In fact, I would say that Julia is less numerical in its compiler than most other languages are because most languages bake quite a lot of numerics into their spec. And Julia allows you to sort of make, you know, changes to all of that stuff and, and support much more. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we, we define everything in libraries. So you could kind of go through and throw away the whole standard library and rewrite it with, you know, no numerical stuff. And then it wouldn't look like a numerical language at all. You could, you could do that. So can you explain some of your interest in uh, interactive computing and the dynamic aspects of the language versus... Uh, in the static analysis and or pre-compiling type of notions. So, you know, even though, you know, we, we just talked about how Julia is completely general purpose, um, you know, one of the, the sort of use cases that, that primarily drove us in the early days was that, you know, uh, technical or scientific computing tends to be, uh, you know, not very good uh, or was not until Julia came along. And one of the things that, that numerical users or scientists often like is the ability to you know, I just want to start a REPL. I want to run some code on it. I don't want to sort of fiddle around with, you know, types. And so the ability to sort of generate code dynamically, jit it, run it, is fairly ingrained in technical computing workflows uh, that, you know, that was sort of a must for us. And that's just kind of how we like developing things. Of course, under the hood, if you look at most Julia programs, they don't tend to be that dynamic in nature. Depending on your application, like there are people who write real-time applications using Julia, and they tend to sort of not use as many dynamic language capabilities. Fundamentally, you, you can get quite a ways uh, without sort of getting type annotations and such into your programs, but still being fairly um, dynamic under the hood. Yeah, and we, we, we've just always been very focused on the interactive use case. We're kind of, you know, interactive prompt nuts over, over here in, in the Julia world. We just love, you know, type, typing in pieces of code incrementally, redefining things, trying things. Uh, it's just it's just the way I, I like to work on on code, uh, so that we've always been really really focused on on the interactive prompt, and I think we have, we have one of the better ones. Honestly, it's it just has a has a lot of functionality, 
interactive help. We've worked on, you know, making sure all values sort of print with some nice text output. Uh, we, sp we spend a lot of time on that. I've heard one of the recent concerns is how LLVM gets slower with each release. And I presume this is competition with uh, interactive use case. So we, we use LLVM as our backend and it's generally fantastic. I mean, it's, you know, that we, that gives us lots of, uh, you know, classic uh, compiler optimizations and code generation for multiple architectures basically for free so it's it's the perfect thing for us to use uh, I don't think there's any real alternative to it uh, so it's great but uh, but there's a little a little bit of a culture mismatch where they are very focused on static compilers so they mostly care about runtime performance code size uh, they don't care that much about compile time uh, because you'll be compiling your whole program up front uh, whereas we get interactive uh, compile pauses as you work which can be a few seconds uh, and can be very annoying and we would, we'd like to, you know, get rid of those completely. So, and, and they're not as focused on, you know, making compile times as low as possible uh, as we would be. But we, you know, we work through that. So many of the Julia compiler contributors also have sort of LLVM, you know, contributor access. So we, we work closely with that community and, and, you know, they're definitely aware of things that are important to us. But eventually, you know, a lot of these uh, engineers are paid for by Apple or Google and driven for, you know, through sort of those kinds of uh, priorities. Um, I, I would say that you know it's 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 been uh, it's it's gotten slow over the last couple of releases, but I would imagine that things will improve uh, going forward. Like I don't think it's a one-way street. Oh, uh, a couple of side things. Let's talk syntax and language design a little bit. Of course, Python and MATLAB, at least in the worlds I've lived in, have been like the biggest contenders in scientific computing. And at least superficially, when you first look at it, you say, "Oh, uh, Julia looks more like MATLAB." How do you make those decisions, and how do you feel it's worked out? So, if the axis is Python to MATLAB. Uh, if, if that's the space that I guess is closer to MATLAB. Um, but, you know, that's, that, I think that's not really the whole space. I mean, there aren't that many options, right? Like if you have an array, there's only like three types of brackets you can use. And, you know, the angle brackets are out because you're going to use them for equality operations. You're left with like maybe a couple others. And if you've got your function calls using the parentheses, the round ones, then like, you know, what, what's your option? People feel like one thing looks like the other. I mean, like, for example, we were very clear that we don't want the language to be white white space sensitive. So, you know, you, you now either have, you know, braces or you have begin and end. And, uh, you know, we just kind of picked some of the choices that we were sort of comfortable with and ran with it. Yeah, I mean, I think they're one thing that uh, Python and MATLAB and Julia all have in common is we're all kind of trying to make languages that look like pseudocode. You know, we, we the way we approach it is if you were to write out a code example, you know, in the simplest most understandable pseudocode you could imagine. You know, what would that look like? And then can that be used as the actual syntax of a language? Another question related to somewhat syntax, but one of the first things I see when I first go to the Julia documentation is emphasizing you can have Unicode identifiers. Uh, I've also seen Unicode operators being used in Julia. Is that commonplace or how does that work out? Yeah, I think it's a, it, it's not as novel now maybe as it was uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but I think we do use a lot more of the operators than, than most languages do. We have uh, something like a hundred-ish. And ever growing. In, infix Unicode operators that you can use. Yeah, given that a lot of users in Julia come from the mathematical community, it's, it's something that, that users definitely sort of appreciate that, you know, you have your research paper and you have your code and they can kind of look exactly the same, which cuts down on the number of errors that you might have in translation and just sort of makes things easy to read. And, and people really appreciate that, you know, after all, you know, code and mathematics are almost all about notation and about sort of, you know, how you convert the idea into, you know, into something that works. Yeah, actually one of, one of my favorite kind of non-obvious Julia features, because it's not really a feature of the language, it's, it's really a feature of like front ends, uh, is how easy it is to type Unicode characters, is you can basically type like backslash alpha or a similar, mm -hmm. you know, LaTeX sort of sequence and hit tab and it'll replace it with the Unicode character. And it sort of feels like it's part of the language because everyone in the community has done a very good job of making that available in like every editor mode and every interactive front end. I was looking a bit at the upcoming 1.5 release notes. Do you guys break compatibility much and or how does that, those kind of decisions get made? Uh, so we, we're following semantic versioning currently. So okay. everything should generally be compatible in the, the 1.x series. Uh, but in, in, a, in a minor release, we can add features and we will sometimes uh, we'll sometimes change something that in theory could maybe break a program, but you know, we think it's extremely unlikely. If you think about it, almost any change whatsoever could potentially break a program. If, if you use undocumented APIs, you know, yeah, those, are not just, guaranteed, you know, those are not part of the spec, right? So that's not right. part of 1.0 guarantee. So if, if, and there are people 
who sort of rely on the compiler internals for certain kinds of packages. I don't think those users have an expectation of things working across releases, but we pretty much run the entire um, set of, you know, about 3000 Julia packages to a package evaluator for every release. And we're very sort of careful about sort of checking any kinds of breakage that happens across releases. And you, know, you asked about how, how we make this decision. So we have every other week or so a uh, public call that anyone can join where we kind of go through a list of uh, issues to be triaged and decided on. And we try to make those kinds of decisions like, is this change too breaking? Th things like that. Yeah. Well, and, and, and people are already discussing these on GitHub and Discourse, right? So it's not that you have to be on the call to get your voice in, but it's where like the final decisions get made if, if you know, if one needs to be made. Uh, what do you see the most exciting things in Julia going forward? Oh, there's a lot. I'll say personally for me, the, the fact that GPU computing in Julia has become so much easier than any other language is amazing. The fact that you can interactively sort of, you know, write GPU kernels and get the same performance as C++ is, is phenomenal. And uh, the rate at which all the multi-threading and parallel computing things are growing in Julia now, I mean, we're already sort of pretty good with that, but it is getting significantly better um, by the day now. So. Jeff, you have anything to say on it? Yeah, I mean, we just have, you know, a, a list of, of any sorts of uh, limitations and problems that we know about that, that people have. And we're just over time, we want to go through all of them one by one. So if you want, you know, small executables uh, and stuff like that, that's a little tricky to do in Julia now. We're, we're working through all of those things and, and we want to be as comprehensive as possible. Well, I think the other one that I'm, you know, particularly excited about where we have a lot more work to be done is the area of, you know, so-called differentiable programming where, you know, you can sort of take an automatic derivative of you know uh, an arbitrary julia function you know within constraints of course but having something like that is going to be a fundamentally amazing thing because you know people spend so much time writing gradients by hand and if, if you could have that job be done by the compiler i mean it's just going to be a, a completely different world as far as a lot of uh, mathematical um, scientific code is concerned yeah, that's on every programmer's to-do list for 2020 differentiate one of your programs <laughs> you have to cross it off the list very good. Any other final words here? Um, no, not particularly. I think, uh, you know, I'd like to thank you for sort of conducting this interview. And thank you both also for your time as well. I really appreciate it. All right. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, y'all. Bye.